tornado one and a half north of Gerald? Yes. I'll take cover. It doesn't look like a real large one, but it could get big. And it's, it's like coming our way. Uh, we wonder if we can get the, just the bell to go off or something so people will know. West County 911. Yes, we have a tornado right over here, right on top of us. Okay, ma'am, are you where you can get to some cover? Yes, ma'am, we're where we can get to some cover. The morning of May 27th, 1997 was hot and humid, even for Central Texas standards. The National Weather Service was keeping a close eye on the region, as the potential for a few severe storms seemed possible. However, the weather pattern in place was far from a classic severe weather setup. The mid-level flow across central Texas was quite weak as the result of a northward-lifting upper-level low-pressure system in the northern plains. Alongside this, large-scale forcing was displaced to the north. Morning atmospheric observations would reveal the presence of a cold front draped across the region, originating from a surface low in northern Arkansas, alongside a pair of outflow boundaries spawned by overnight storms across east Texas. A very subtle gravity wave could also be seen propagating southward towards the Waco area. It too spawned by decaying overnight storms. Atmospheric soundings produced by the National Weather Service in Fort Worth identified mid-level lapse rates that were rather steep, a sign that thunderstorm updrafts would be able to gain impressive acceleration within the atmosphere. The humidity recalled by so many that day was also very high, with dew points reaching a temperature of 73 degrees Fahrenheit, with localized pockets of even higher dew points across the portions of central Texas that later in the day would see so much destruction. Wind shear was also seen to be relatively low, something that would usually hint at lower tornadic potential. However, there was enough wind combined with the incredible instability to produce supercells. The question was whether or not these supercells would then manage to produce tornadoes. Around noon, the cold front had continued to progress across the region and was now approaching the city of Waco. The gravity wave feature was also moving through this area, likely adding lift to the region, which would later aid in the initiation of storms. Large, towering cumulus clouds had developed across the region and were primed for explosion into ferocious supercell thunderstorms. Just before 3 p.m. that day, students and faculty associated with the Texas A&M University Convection and Lightning Experiment would take atmospheric soundings near the town of Calvert, Texas, to the east of the cities of Temple and Gerald. These soundings would find convective available potential energy, or CAPE, values of around 5,000 joules per kilogram, with a slight cap, which would later help to keep storms isolated and discrete, instead of quickly congealing into a massive squall line. To say the least, the environment in place across central Texas was one of the most impressive one could see from a thermodynamic standpoint. It was just a matter of whether or not the other pieces of the puzzle could fall into place. Let me down some more, a whole lot wider at the base. Lower and lower, look at the debris coming up around it. Wow, wow. Fourteen oh three county is coming right. Woo, he's really starting it up now. Uh eastbound toward the interstate. It's a grinder and Thunderstorms near Waco initiated just prior to noon. These storms would progress very slowly to the southwest, at speeds as low as five miles per hour. It was shortly after these storms formed that the Storm Prediction Center issued a tornado watch for the region. One storm that had initiated north of the city of Temple would quickly explode in intensity in the extremely unstable air mass that was present. Soon, the storm would become tornadic, producing three tornadoes in quick succession. First near the town of Lorena, then near Bruceville Eddy, and then near Moody. This tornado, the one near Moody, would become the first significant, or F2+, plus, tornado of the day. The twister would eventually attain an F3 rating as it tossed cars and trucks like toys during its 20-minute life. As the supercell passed the city of Temple, it once again became tornadic. Two tornadoes would touch down, first along the shores of Belton Lake, and then another near the Stillhouse Dam. These tornadoes, however, were just the beginning, as in a matter of minutes, one of the most intense tornadoes ever documented would develop.
At 3.40 p.m., a small rope-shaped funnel cloud made contact with the ground to the northwest of Gerald. It was only a matter of seconds before this measly rope grew into a large multi-vortex behemoth half a mile wide. The twister at this point was already violent as it tore large swaths of asphalt out of the small country roads it crossed paths with. As the tornado entered Gerald, it was moving at a snail's pace. Like a dead man walking, at 3.48 p.m., the twister entered the Double Creek subdivision. The tornado was now three quarters of a mile wide and at its peak intensity. Homes across the subdivision were slabbed in seconds. Families who sheltered in their closets as far from windows as they could in the interior most parts of their homes, like they had always been told to, stood no chance. The tornado sat on top of Double Creek Estate for minutes on end and slabbed those homes clean off of their foundations. The pieces that made up those homes were ground up into minuscule particles and scattered around the ground. National Weather Service surveyors noted the complete lack of large debris as they entered Gerald shortly after the tornado tore through the city. It wasn't until they looked closer that they saw the tiny pieces of dust and wood chips that once made up the homes in the area. The dirt beneath them was scoured and the trees were ripped off their bark. Over 300 cattle grazing in a pasture near the subdivision were slaughtered by the twister, many skinned. Some were thrown as far as one-fourth of a mile away. All 27 human fatalities caused by the tornado occurred in the Double Creek Estates. As the tornado left Gerald, it continued the southwest before finally lifting in a wooded area. Left behind in the Twister's wake was a town left broken. However, the residents of Gerald kept their spirits intact. The community banded together as one to help the survivors in the Double Creek Estates recover. The cleanup efforts were long and traumatic for many residents, but in time the area had been cleaned up and rebuilt. Looking at Google Maps today, we can see that the homes destroyed by the tornado have been rebuilt over time. A memorial park dedicated to the victims has also been erected, within it baseball diamonds used by local youth leagues. The community has never forgotten those lost on that day and have not forgotten the strength and intensity of that tornado. But the town showed that it was stronger than that tornado that tore through their city on that fateful May day in 1997. And I think that we can all take something out of that. It's a great testament to the resiliency of human beings and proof that we can truly overcome anything. Thank you for watching this video. This was a remake of a video we made nearly three years ago that our team has been meaning to remake for ages. None of us really liked how it turned out. We hope that this video did a better job of conveying the events than that one did. If you liked this video, please like and subscribe and leave a comment. See you next time.